guys and girls. So um, when we talk about grain structure as knife makers, it can get pretty um, pretty complex. And I know my boy Sam Towns likes to do very complex videos with big words, and I very highly recommend you check them out because he is extremely thorough in explaining the processes of heat treatment and what goes on in the steel when that happens. One thing that isn't talked about super often is why do you want to get a nice tight grain structure? And you know me, I like to talk about the importance of why. But one thing that you hear all the time, people saying you've got to get a tight grain structure, you've got to get a small grain structure in your steel when you're making knives or trying to make tough knives. The smaller and tighter the grain structure, the tougher the knife is going to be. There's more to it than that, but a lot of people know this and they'll tell you, oh, you've got to do that, you've got to do that. But most people wouldn't be able to tell you why. Now, the answer as to why is very, very complex, and metallurgy is a, a, a field which honestly is a rabbit hole you could dive down for a very, very long time, and uh, I do, <laughs> I know quite a bit of the science of it, and I've discussed it on the Forge Cars podcast that I co-host with my boy Sam, uh, but I would like to try and explain it to you in as simple a terms as possible with visual aids, because I am a big proponent of understanding the why of things. Now, for the people who are into metallurgy who are watching this, I want to tell you up front, I know that this is an extremely simplified uh, way of explaining this, but that's kind of the point. So this is aimed to simplify it down to something very visual and easy to understand so that people can start understanding why you want to chase smaller and tighter grains to get tougher knives. And that's the entire purpose of this video. So before the keyboard warriors start clickety clacketing, just know this is deliberately simplified and visual to help people understand. So let's have a look at my balls. Don't get too excited. I'm talking about my ball bearings. <laughs> I'm aware of the pun that this is a nut loaf jar. Anyway, let's imagine that these are our steel molecules inside of a piece of steel. And when you heat them up, they all start moving around because that's what heating something does. It's giving kinetic energy to the molecules within the thing and it starts getting crazy. And then all of a sudden, you once you've heated it to a specific point, you will quench it, which is going to take all of these things from moving around and make them organize like that. And you'll notice that with these ball bearings, mostly they are trying to fall into a little um, hexagonal lattice. But there are irregularities. There are little holes, little sort of fractures, if you will. You know, they've got, trying to bump it here and here and here and here, the other one over here. They're just natural fractures. And this is going to happen every time I do it, more or less. See the little fractures? Now, these are all exactly the same size, but when they are suddenly arrested in their movement, they form little fractures. Those fractures are the boundaries of our grains in steel. There you go, there's another one. If you do this on a large enough uh, level, obviously I've got here about a hundred ball bearings. The number of molecules in a piece, even a small piece of steel, it's a lot more than a hundred. And so you can imagine this happening on a very, very large scale with billions and billions of steel molecules. And then all of a sudden they're arrested and all of those little imperfections are going to be there. Now, how hot you get it is going to dictate how much these things are moving around. And how quickly you quench it is going to dictate how they are arrested into a lattice. And that's why the temperature that you get it up to and the speed at which you quench it matter in the formation of that lattice. So, when we look at this on a larger level, let's zoom all the way out so that we can see this and visualize this with millions and billions of steel molecules. I'll show you what these little imperfections end up looking like. Like this. So as you, if you were to take the same thing that I just did with the ball bearings, but you had millions of ball bearings or even just several hundred or a few thousand, and you put them into a larger nut jar lid, 
and dropped them suddenly to arrest their movement, just like we did, instead of having a dot here and there that there's an imperfection, you would find that there are these lines, crinkly lines running all the way through it. And this is what happens. It's all just a solid block of steel molecules, but those imperfections form these lines. Now, these lines are small, fractures is probably the wrong word, but basically you can think of them like fractures in the fabric of the makeup of the steel. And each one of these sections is a grain. Now, why do you want them to be small? Why does them being small equal toughness in a piece of steel? Well, that actually comes down to how steel bends, what happens when it bends. So let me explain exactly what happens when steel bends, and you'll start understanding why small grain structure equals tough steel. Uh, by the way, if you want to talk toughness and how that works uh, in uh, the same sort of super simple, quick um, video format like this, uh, I did a 60-second explanation of Young's modulus of elasticity, which is the physics principle about how uh, steel toughness works, kind of. So, yeah, check it out. Now, it's easy to think that when you are bending a piece of steel, what you're doing is actually stretching and rearranging these steel molecules that are set up in that lattice that we talked about. You would think that they would stretch and move around, but the thing is, the distance that those steel particles can be apart is limited. Think of it like they're being connected by a string that is only of a certain length, and so they can only get so far apart before that string is taut, and once it's taut, it can't go any further. So if this is the case, and they're sat in this lattice that's all pulled apart, and remember, this is quenched steel, so it's quite hard. The only way to actually move those things apart is to actually break those bonds. And when you break those bonds, you get snapped steel. So how do we make it bend? In amongst each grain, you see a lattice of steel particles. But all the way through it, just due to the nature of how steel molecules like to arrange themselves, there are small imperfections where one row doesn't quite line up perfectly with the next row. And because of that, there's these little floating molecules that are not fully bonded in all directions like the other steel particles. So when you bend a piece of steel, these little imperfections travel. The steel particles move apart and rearrange themselves as this imperfection slides through the steel, and that allows it to bend. And the further this uh, imperfection travels, the more the piece of steel bends. Now there's only one thing that can actually stop these imperfections from sliding through the steel, and that is reaching one of these uh, quote-unquote fractures at the end of a of a grain of steel. So once it reaches one of these uh, dividing points in your grain structure, it stops. It stops sliding and it can't travel any further. Because of this, the bigger your grain structure is, the bigger those grains are, the further those imperfections can slide. And the further they can slide, the more the steel can bend. If your grain structure is really, really tight, these imperfections can only travel a very short distance. And if they can only travel a very short distance, it means that they will not allow your steel to bend particularly far. And that makes it tough. In fact, so tough that the only way to actually move the steel at all is to break it. And this creates toughness. The complete process of heat treatment involves various stages, annealing the steel so that it is worked in an annealed state, normalizing the steel very, very thoroughly helps arrange all of those steel molecules in a way where stresses are taken out of it. And quenching it correctly with the correct quenchant and the correct temperatures and soak times, etc., allow those particles to be uh, jiggling around in just the right way and then cooling it at the right speed to the right temperature within the right time frame is what arranges them in the ideal lattice for that steel. And then you temper it to just bring back the hardness a little bit because while tempering does not 
have any real noticeable effect on the grain structure, it does remove a bit of the hardness. And the hardness is those little bonds, those little bits of string that we talked about. And it makes them give a little more rather than just snap. Because hardened and untempered steel um, is, is most likely going to just snap on you. So now, hopefully, this gives you a better understanding of why you want to try and chase a tight grain structure in your steel instead of just knowing that you've got to. Because I do have a problem with people just knowing something but not knowing why that thing is the case. So I thought this is just a short video to help visualize a very complex topic in a very simple way. This is a huge oversimplification, but uh, I do highly recommend, if you find this interesting, uh, I highly recommend obviously looking at Sam Town's video that um, I linked to before, but also to pick up this book. This book here, Knife Engineering, will set you up with, uh, if you are interested in the metallurgy of knives, you really can't do much better. It will explain things far better than I can. It's a bit of a tough slog if you're new to knife making, uh, but if you want to try and perfect the art form and up your game when it comes to the metallurgy of it, then definitely give it a read. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Um, all my relevant links below. Big thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping make this video possible. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye. In R and more in the county Galway, one pleasant evening in the month of May, I spied a damsel. 